the science educator, the CEO of the Planetary Society, the science guy himself, Bill Nye, joins us to talk about his Kickstarter project, the light sail, a bread box size spacecraft powered by the light of the sun. This project that is, this isn't a fancy reflector just to give you more light in the studio. Um, that's right, it, yeah, it's, it works for you. So what, is, what are we looking at here? So this is a model, a replica of the light sail spacecraft. This is one tenth uh, scale, so uh, the real this, one's 10 times as big. What's this ten, little part in the so middle? So that's called a CubeSat cubical satellite. And it's about how big in real life? About it's the size uh, of this table? 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 30 centimeters. That's, that's it. it. Fits in a shoebox. Smaller than most loaves of bread. Okay. The idea is extraordinary. And when I was in Carl Sagan's class, back in the disco era, <laughs> he, talked about, he talked about a solar sail. And this is something that doesn't seem real at first, but light has momentum. Even though it's pure energy and has no mass, it still gives things a push. And we're not talking about the solar wind. Those are particles streaming off of stars, off the sun. Uh, they have about a hundredth, and then sometimes, depending on the weather on the sun, a five hundredth of the momentum of the light. The light is what gives it a push. So if you have a low enough mass spacecraft and a big enough sail, it gets a push. And furthermore, an extraordinary thing, if it's shiny, it gets plus velocity going this way, minus, minus velocity going that way, so it gets two, two times the push. A push and a push. When it's shiny, yeah. And so we flew light sail A, as we call it, the, our test flight a few weeks ago. And uh, uh, it, it went out of co communication. Couldn't get in touch with it. Couldn't talk to it. Then apparently it got hit. Boop, boop. He said, space, there's no noise. With a cosmic <laughs> ray, it caused the computer to reboot. So then we could talk to it for a while. Then something else happened, and we don't know what it was, and we couldn't communicate with it again the last few days. I went up on the roof here. We're in New York City, everybody. Went up on the roof of the building where I live, and... These guys, uh, the people who work in this business can tell exactly where it is in the sky. I mean, this thing is this big. Your tax dollars at work, they can find exactly where it is and track it. So I was looking in exactly the right direction. And it showed up, I think, a few seconds later than their computer model. But, I, you know, I'm not sure. But anyway, there it was. And I saw it, just this pinprick go through the sky. It was really moving for me. So... Understand that Carl Sagan talked about this in 1976. He founded the Planetary Society. I'm now the CEO of the Planetary Society. So 39 years later, we flew our first test flight. And next year, September of 2016, on the beloved SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket, mm -hmm. we're going to launch our the real one, the primary mission, and we're going to get a real push and increase orbital energy, and we're all very excited about that. So does this stay powered by the sun as well? Oh, yeah. So there's solar panels. The blue, the blue uh, color here, is, yep. uh, those are solar panels. And one of the benefits, with all this mirror, you get a lot, a lot of electricity. That's not, there's no shortage. So what are you hoping to accomplish, just to show that... To change the world. Of course. So... <laughs> one planet at a time. Well, but... so... This enables missions to distant destinations in the solar system at very low cost. There's no fuel. Once you're on orbit, you know, it goes up on a conventional chemical rocket. <laughs> Once you're on orbit, then on orbit is how we talk. That's yeah, the, that's that's the, the sound effect. That was also good. Yeah, <laughs> the, yeah. In, you could say in orbit, but, you know, when you're just so hip, you say yeah. on orbit. Yeah. Okay. So the sail deploys, which is tricky. Because uh, uh, there's no vacuum chamber on Earth big enough to handle the whole thing when all four are out. That's it's really weird. R really? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, then it gets a push from the sun, and the deal is there are gyroscopes or momentum wheel inside, and you can twist in inertial space. And the energy for that comes from electricity f converted from sunlight. All right, so you're the... Uh, you're the sun. Here's the earth. Oh, let's do this. Here's the earth. The sail will go like this, and then we'll twist it and come at you like that and twist again. And it's tacking just like a sailboat. I mean, perfectly analogous to a sailboat. 
And then you build orbital energy, and you can go to the moon, you could go to Mars. And the, and the thing is, there's no fuel, you never run out. So even though the push is tiny, about nine micronewtons per square meter. Okay. Nine quarters of a pound per square meter. So what happens when it goes on the dark side of the Earth, so to speak? Well, it's in orbit. It just keeps going. Doesn't matter. It's all the other spacecraft. Just right. So it's not powered. It, do, it doesn't need the power, at least when it... Oh, there's batteries. The I follow batteries you. Yeah, there's, there's conventional batteries. Now, the thing about these CubeSats, there's companies that make parts. Like, you can go online and buy CubeSat solar panels. How, CubeSat th how thick are these sails? Oh, so uh, this one is four and a half microns. You have very dark hair. You're probably at 100 microns. Yeah, thickness That's of your hair. That's how thick the sails yeah, feel are. It. This is the real material. And you reach in because there's a little reinforcement to make it uh, uh, so I can carry it around without damaging it. Wow. But you see it has a little rip stop going yeah. on there? Anyway, so this is about um, a 20th or 25th of your hair, a 20th of my hair. And, and it's commercially available. It's not rare stuff. You know? And you got this uh, crowdfunded? Yes, exactly. So... First of all, this sale, uh, the white sale, the first test mission, was already funded. We have people, we have 40,000, almost 45,000 members around the world that just think this is an intriguing idea, and they paid for it over the last, depends how you count, uh, 20 years. Uh, now, to ensure that our next mission works, we had a Kickstarter campaign, and we set a couple records. I'm very proud. Thank you out there, members and supporters. We doubled faster than anybody else, and then we doubled the doubling faster than anybody else. That's what they told us. I'm not an expert on Kickstarter. So what, what did you statistics. want to raise, and how much did you raise? We wanted 200000 We would really like to get to a million. You know, that's a number, but you it's a cool You get a free mug one. if you know. Exactly. No, you get a, a T-shirt bag. and a mission patch. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. styling. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so uh, the mission patch is very, I'm very proud of that. So you get, a, let's say you'll have a million bucks, you'll put this up next year, and it is going to show that our you can build a three unit CubeSat for estimates vary a third of what NASA could build it for, a half anyway, and send it to wherever you want in the solar system if you have time. You can trade money for time. And these CubeSats are. Uh, built by a lot of universities, a lot of students build CubeSats. This will enable universities to take missions farther and deeper into space. And the other people who are quite interested in it is the Air Force. The Air Force is quite interested in this because they can fly a flotilla of small satellites and they can act together like a large antenna, a Almost large like a aperture. swarm of satellites. A that... swarm, of, exactly, a swarm of satellites. And uh, the solar sail then will enable them to not have fuel on board of each of these small things, but just keep going. And then the other mission, which, because a lot of uh, people who work at the Jet Propulsion Lab and the Applied Physics Lab, JPL, APL, they're members of the Planetary Society. And so we're all in this together. But one of the cool ideas is the lunar flashlight. What's that? Okay. <laughs> so you get one of these in orbit around the moon and then you shine light from it into a crater to measure the ice. There's water ice in craters on the moon. I used to be very skeptical of that, but it's there. Water ice is on the moon. So you could use a, a series of these that you could launch at very low cost yeah, to try to have it circling around the moon. For example, okay. and the, other, the other mission that solar sailing is just ideal for is monitoring what we call solar weather. Now, the word weather, you know, it doesn't right. really rain on the sun. <laughs> But it has these corona mass ejections, except it's in space. Yeah. And uh, all these particles come streaming toward the Earth. And if you put a spacecraft in about the orbit of Venus, about that far from the sun, you could monitor the sun and then tell the Earth when... Hey, it's coming. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then what we do, humankind, is turn all our... Um, communication satellites so their their backs are to the wind, if you will, because so they get damage damaged, them. yeah. And everybody relies on space assets. Don't kid yourself. People complain when the weather report's off 10 minutes. You know? So speaking of uh, this very, very thin substance, 
Isn't it's it mylar. Isn't it susceptible to sort of damage? Isn't there a bunch of space junk floating around? Well, you know, people talk about that. What if thing, something pierces it? Yeah. And it has a ripstop quality, but that rips or feature, but that ripstop is really for deploying or uh, right. make, unfurling it. There isn't that much space stuff. If this thing got hit with a wrench going uh, in the other direction at 28 kilometers an hour, you'd have trouble, yeah. But uh, along that line, space debris is a huge problem. And one of the applications that everybody's interested in our solar sail for is deorbiting satellites. That's a verb, to take they satellites. Start to fall back down. They're required by law, by international treaty, to come down every, within 25 years. 25 years. That's how you think in space. And how many hundreds are there up there? Oh, there's thousands. Thousands of satellites. Yeah, yeah. And they have to come down. Eventually, eventually. yeah, yeah. And so if you, so what's traditionally done, and it's funny to use the word traditional, it's a space business, it's only 50 years old, but you put extra fuel on board and squirt it, you, you retro fire, and then you fall into the Earth's atmosphere and burn up, which is what happened with our first light sail, which is part of the plan. Uh, but... Uh, if you had a sail on it, it would be a much cheaper and probably a little bit more reliable way to deorbit satellites because we developed this mechanism that is unique. And it's just from having people really applying themselves. And, of course, the guy who solved the problem was, you know, was he still in high school? I don't know. He's, he's a very <laughs> young guy, engineer. And uh, uh, NASA, see, deployed a sail very similar to this that they called Nano Sail D. It was smaller than light sail, uh, and it didn't deploy for almost six weeks. And no one's exactly sure why. Everybody thinks that eventually it shook loose from when you go night and day, night and day, heating and cooling, heating and cooling, eventually it whee, worked its way out. But we, I strongly believe we solved that problem. And sure enough, we got the picture. We got that main picture. Ooh. Ooh. All right, Bill Nye, the CEO of the Planetary Society and author of the book, Undeniable. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Let's change the world.